President. Thank you very much for that. I'm Alan Asher and I'll be chairing this session. However, it is you with the assistance of the presenters and discussants who will be doing the hard work. And that just to give one indication of the relevance of this session, elsewhere in this hotel at this very minute, there's a three-day conference that's being held uh, by an agricultural chemicals group. It's a, it's a global conference. And one of the, the topics that they've considered, it was uh, on, the, on the agenda yesterday, was the post-patent outlook for generics. And I spoke this morning to uh, some of the people at that conference, and they pointed out that in the agricultural chemical sector for pesticides, weedicides, and some uh, fertilizers, there are a number of key agricultural chemicals that are soon to come off uh, patents. And I asked them what they expected to happen. The key presenter there was uh, somebody from um, an in the in uh, Agricultural uh, Intelligence Unit. He expects that prices across the range of those products will fall significantly, and they expect a very large increase in the sales of those products. Now, uh, d is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. Um, would the products have even been on the market without intellectual property uh, in the first place? I don't know. Uh, however, the point in raising this uh, anecdote with you is to show that the things that we're doing in, in a somewhat more abstract way uh, in this very same hotel are being worked through in a very practical and a specific way with consequence. And for the purposes of this session, and I hope others, that that's just how we will treat it, that this has consequence, that we're, we're talking not just about some abstract ideas or going over issues that many of us have discussed uh, over years and, and I fear, in my case, decades, but instead, we'll be looking for some important new insights, uh, some avenues for action, and that these things will build into the action agenda that Cuts hopes to come from, from this conference. So uh, could I remind all, uh, de all delegates, when we have some questions and answers, if you could look particularly at how these matters might be made relevant and alive and carried forward to possibly to the um, OECD Consumer Policy Committee or to the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development Research Agenda at the next Intergovernmental Experts Meeting in July in Geneva or to the ICN or, or to universities. Let's also be looking out for uh, some current bilateral or multilateral trade negotiations where IP is a part of them to see if some of the things that we've discussed and learned may fit into that as well. And so my call is for focus and relevance and things that, uh, that can go forward. That doesn't mean people shouldn't be uh, open about, uh, about questions, but it does mean uh, we should be uh, looking for, for those opportunities. And so I'm now going to invite our first presenter, Thomas Chang, uh, to speak, followed by immediately uh, Keith Maskus and Shamna Bashir. So, please. Good morning, okay. good morning, everyone. Good uh, morning, Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here with you today. And uh, first of all, I apologize in advance if I um, am not coherent. I was stranded in Mumbai last night, and I have not slept for thirty something hours. So um, I will try my best. I believe I have ten minutes. Is that right? Uh, 
okay, I think I should be able to make it through 10 minutes. And um, well, I'm, I'm very pleased to be on this panel, on this plenary session, because there are quite a number of familiar faces. Uh, Ellen and I worked on the uh, uh, energy market industry study report uh, for the Consumer Council in Hong Kong three years ago, I think. Yes. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, nothing came out of that. The government um, um, rejected our suggestion to liberalize the market. Uh, and uh, Shamnat and I go way back. We studied in Oxford together 15 years ago. So um, I haven't seen you for 10 years. Yeah, so it's been a while. I'm very glad to see him here. And then uh, Keith, uh, Professor Mascus, actually, well, I, this is the first time I've met him, but I've met his work many times because actually he's very, quite extensively cited in the article I'm presenting on today. Um, and uh, Daryl, I've been quite a few years too. I've uh, met him quite a few times in conferences, so I'm very glad to be on a panel of familiar faces. Um, but uh, so let me get to the uh, the meat of my presentation. Um, I'll keep it short. But um, the idea is very simple. Um, so we all know that when uh, we look at the patent antitrust interface, uh, patent law focuses on um, generating innovation incentives, protecting innovation incentives, making sure that uh, potential inventors and innovators have the incentive to create the innovations that we need. Uh, antitrust, um, well, to put it simply, I mean, antitrust focuses on both static efficiency and um, dynamic efficiency, but mainly antitrust is focused on uh, allocative efficiency, um, obtaining lower prices for consumers, uh, better quality of products. And um, so depending on who you talk to, some people say there is really no conflict between the two areas of law. Some people say there is a conflict. Um, I believe there is one. So when we look at the patent antitrust interface, there is a need to balance between the need to secure lower prices for consumers and the need to protect innovation incentives. And um, I believe from a developing country perspective, uh, we need to be a bit more circumspect when we are asked to protect uh, innovation incentives. Um, we know that, I mean, if in the discourse in America and to a lesser extent Europe, whenever we deal with patent antitrust issues, the first instinct is we need to protect innovation incentives, um, dynamic efficiency yields the greatest uh, improvement in economic welfare and well-being, and um, dynamic efficiency results in much better improvements in consumer welfare than allocative efficiency ever could. Um, that is all well and true in um, a developed country context, but in a developing country context, I think we need to be a lot more, we need to be a lot, we need to scrutinize such arguments much more closely. And um, I mean, my, my paper is about 80 pages long, so obviously I can't summarize it in, um, in 10 minutes. But um, the basic insight is, um, if you look at both the theoretical literature and empirical literature in economics, there are doubts that economists have um, cast on the extent to which patent protection is necessary for in, uh, generating innovation incentives. Um, from a theoretical perspective, we know that um, the extent to which patent protection is needed depends on the extent to which imitation happens absent patent protection. And that depends on the ease of imitation and the cost of imitation. So there are industries where the ease of imitation is low and the cost of imitation are high. And so even absent uh, patent protection, the innovator will have a lead time over its potential imitating competitors. And in that case, there are reasons to, to, uh, to doubt the extent to which patent protection is strictly necessary to generate innovation incentives. And if you look at the empirical literature, uh, over the years there have been studies that have looked at um, the extent to which patent protection and other mechanisms are uh, important, are essential to generating innovations in different industries. And these studies um, have pretty much come to the same conclusion, which is there are some industries for which patent protection is important. Um, especially pharmaceuticals and chemicals. No surprise there. 
but for a, a lot of other industries such as complex machinery, electrical engineering, etc., cetera, um, patent protection, these studies time again found that patent protection is not the most important appropriation mechanism for um, actors in these industries. Lead time, learning curve uh, advantages, and um, brand recognition, etc., are found to be more important than patent protection. So what that means is that um, in striking a balance um, in the patent and antitrust interface, to the extent all that is true, we don't need to pay as much attention to the importance of protecting innovation incentives. And what is more important from a developing country perspective is the fact that um, imitation often plays as much of an important role as genuine innovation uh, in the um, technological progress in developing countries. Most developing countries, well, for, well uh, it's a bit of a generalization. Um, the extent to which it is true depends on the country and the sector. I mean, there are obviously the in developing countries such as China and India, which are on the global technological, technological frontier in some industries, but for a lot of the developing industry, uh, developing countries, um, I would dare to say, um, they're, they are not on the global technolo technological frontier in most industries. And for them, innovation really is imitation of leading technologies from developed countries. Um, economists have written uh, time and again that I imitation is not easy. Um, imitation itself requires research. In order to learn and copy and replicate an advanced technology, um, firms in developing countries need to do their own research to be able to localize the technology. Implementation of a technology requires uh, tacit knowledge, knowledge that is not codified in patent protection, in patent application documents and scientific journals. And uh, research is necessary. So in a lot of developing countries, um, Innovation often um, takes place in the form of imitation in the global sense. And um, obviously, if you have very stringent patent protection or very um, permissive rules um, for patent exploitation under antitrust law, you will make it harder for um, firms in developing countries to imitate. And that would retard the technological progress of developing countries. And um, Economists from Robert Solo on have noted time and again that um, it is technological progress that, will, that accounts for a very large part of um, economic growth. Um, technological progress is very important to economic growth and therefore if um, in striking the balance between um, patent policy and antitrust policy, we make it too hard for developing country firms to innovate, we are making it harder for developing countries to grow. And um, of course there's also in striking the balance between uh, in, uh, protection of innovation incentives and consumer welfare, there's also the side of consumer welfare we need to look at. And I would argue that in, for, in developing countries, um, a lot of consumers are very poor, especially consumption, consumers of basic necessities and foodstuffs. And um, to ask them to um, incur consumer welfare loss to generate innovation incentives, um, it's a very difficult ask of them. And we should only do that if we are very certain that the consumer welfare loss is necessary to generate the innovation incentives. And um, my last point, uh, I think I saw the, the red signal. So um, my last point is um, something I call innovation incentive externalities in my article, which is the fact that when um, global innovators, um, developing con developed country firms look at innovation, whether to innovate or not, they don't just look at the patent um, gen uh, innovation incentives generated by the domestic uh, patent system. They look at the patent systems across the world. So one can make the arguments that develop developing country patent systems, they don't just generate innovation incentives for domestic firms, but they also generate innovation incentives for international firms, for MNCs. So in, to the extent that is true, and if we um, curtail patent ex exploitation by way of antitrust rules, and we may 
impair the innovation incentives of these um, um, multinational corporations. But here I argue that, um, first of all, um, it depends on which developing country we're talking about. There are developing countries which are, lar which are large economies with very big markets. Again, I'm talking about the likes of the BRICS countries. And I think for those, it's quite clear that the, um, M uh, the MNC uh, in, uh, innovators do take into account the innovation incentives generated by the patent systems of those countries. But if you're talking about a uh, sub-Saharan landlocked country, I, I highly doubt that the, develop, uh, the MNC innovators would take into account the innovation incentives generated by those patent systems. And, um, and so I would argue that in small uh, develop, developing countries with small domestic markets, um, they should not pay attention to the fact that MNCs may rely on the innovation incentive genera generated by the patent systems because the, the reality is, I argue that in most cases, the, the innovation incentives generated by the domestic patent systems are not important. And, um, and th they probably only account for a very, very small part of the revenue of the um, uh, MNC innovators. And um, if an innovation would otherwise become not worthwhile to pursue because the return to investment becomes 2% smaller than the innovation itself was originally probably only marginally useful. And in that case, we may question um, how important it is that we make sure that that kind of innovation takes place. So I think I, yeah, I'll end right here. And uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Thomas. I'd like to invite uh, Keith Maskus to, to make some comments. Thank you, Alan. And um, I, I'd like to start by uh, thanking the organizers uh, of the conference and Cuts International for the invitation. I've never been to Jaipur before, so this is a great pleasure for me. And, uh, and I'm, I'm also uh, actually an avid consumer of Cuts International's products, uh, their papers. Um, I don't always agree with uh, things that are written by Cuts, but, uh, but I think the analysis is, is typically very strong uh, and certainly makes the case on many of these complex issues on behalf of uh, of developing world. So keeps me informed to say the least. Um, full disclosure, I should tell you that until three weeks ago, uh, I had spent the prior 12 months as the chief economist of the US State Department. Uh, it's not a job I recommend to anyone. But had I been here three weeks ago, what I could say is going to be rather different from what I'll tell you now. Um, so let me turn to Professor Cheng's excellent paper, um, which shows just how complex these questions are, things that we've been discussing for many decades and I think we'll continue to discuss for many decades to come. Uh, so intellectual property rights and competition policy are sometimes described as two sides of the same coin, sometimes they're described as policy initiatives that are uh, in opposition with each other. Uh, what that just will tell you is that, uh, that there are difficult balancing items to be struck here and, and uh, sometimes either side can get out of balance. I will just tell you that in the United States, uh, very few observers would uh, claim that the, uh, the IP system uh, is, is uh, representing a, an appropriate balance between those of innovators, you know, the IP protection is very strong, uh, and, and access uh, and consumer pricing and the rest of these kinds of issues to the point where uh, fairly recently, in the last several years, the U.S. courts have begun to step, to step in and say, wait a minute, maybe we've gone a little too far uh, and we should not be doing things like issuing automatic preliminary injunctions and so on. So in this context, um, there's lesson number one. Keep in mind that the judiciary has a role to play here as well, and, and that's an important issue. So my time is short. I'm going to offer just a few comments on the paper, uh, and then a few, com uh, and then an, an observation or two more, more broadly. Uh, but before I do that, let me just just add one initial uh, observation. Here. These are not only complex issues for any country, whether you're talking about the United States and Europe, or India or China or Burkina Faso, uh, when you add the complexities of globalization, how do you calibrate uh, openness to trade investment to these kinds of issues? Uh, 
Um, and then differences in development levels as well. There has to be some evolution of these policies over time and across countries. Uh, these are very complex questions, and, 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 and Thomas's paper certainly recon, uh, recognizes that complexity. Well, the first comment I'll make on the paper is that uh, you certainly you, you should read it. You'll learn a lot from it. Um, but I find the organization a little bit uh, surprising in that it, it goes 45 pages without actually getting into the question of what are the actual competition policy levers that might be useful for developing countries and might be uh, deployed in, a, in an efficient way. Or even what the concept of patent misuse or abuse might be. Those are two quite different legal standards. And one thing any country's uh, legal system needs to deal with is whether they believe, you know, whether they want to define something called patent misuse or patent abuse. Uh, and, you know, those, it's on simple, but, but, uh, but important distinctions like that, that, uh, that competition policy really rests. So I think readers might get a better sense of the actual policy trade-offs and constraints by bringing forward and emphasizing what these policy levers are and, and the fundamental uh, trade-offs between IP or patents and, uh, and uh, competition. So the paper does emphasize that there's been a very long debate in economics about the role that patents play in innovation and technology transfer. These are important questions. Um, but, but pretty widely discussed in the literature, and, and they do lead to uh, some, some, some clear observations. I mean, there aren't that many poor countries that are innovating much or will be innovating much for some time to come. Uh, their markets tend to be so small that changing the IP system isn't likely to have much uh, effective increase in global demand for new innovation, and so you shouldn't see much in the way of of a, of, a, of a response to that, whether it's through global innovation or technology transfer. Um, and so these are our fundamental characteristics of, of developing countries, particularly the smaller developing countries, uh, that we want to sort of pay more attention to. What is it that's really diminishing the prospects for innovation in these countries, and what are the policy supports that might get us uh, around that? I should say one thing, and, and sort of looking forward, um, I think the discussion on, on technology transfer in particular is a little bit out of date in the paper because we do have a fairly clear consensus among international economists now that, that, that at least among the major emerging middle income economies, the BRICS economies for example, that sort of stronger and, and more transparent intellectual property protection does have the effect of increasing inward technology transfer through FDI or licensing, whatever it is. And, and a big question out in that literature now, so some things I'm working on are, why is that? What are the mechanisms and channels through which that response happens? Uh, that's a very complicated literature, but just to give you one example, so we can think about, about this in the context of this debate, this day and a half debate, is uh, to the extent that, that these rules on intellectual property actually reduce the uncertainty of engaging in the contracting cost of intellectual property transfer, then you're going to see more of it happening uh, in those countries where the market actually supports this kind of transfer. And so that is, is in broad terms, why we see this, this emerging consensus going on. But beyond that, it's all, it's all right. I mean, there's not much argument to be made for the poorest and smallest economies of the world transferring a lot of rents to international companies through the protection of intellectual property. Uh, but if the world is telling you you have to do that, then the, the, the question of how do you deploy competition rules uh, to, to, try to, to try to discipline that is a very important one. A second observation uh, is that, now, now Thomas did mention this and it is in the paper, but I, I don't really think enough distinction is drawn among types of developing countries until pretty late in the paper. But there are important policy differentiation questions that one should uh, I think posed pretty, pretty clearly about the evolution of policies over time. A couple of examples. What is the role of compulsory licensing when there is no domestic production capacity? There is a solution to that sort of in the WTO for, with respect to pharmaceuticals, but there's no solution to that question otherwise. Um, and, uh, and my own view of this is there's real scope, and this is another sort of forward-looking kind of thing, for regional agreements among developing economies, uh, poor developing economies, to try to generate sufficient market size through a combination of trade and intellectual property policy uh, that you might actually get some possibility there. Another example, 
Um, not many global inventions are actually patented in the poor countries. That's just the fact. Um, it's costly to, to patent, and if you don't think there's a market, you're not going to do that. So aiming competition policy at dealing with patent abuse won't accomplish much. So again, what else would we support as policies to promote domestic innovation in, in poor countries? I think that's a fundamental uh, question. I don't have great answers for it, but if, in the general discussion, we could actually talk about it a little bit. A third thing, again, is this importance of sectoral differences in calibrating intellectual property and competition. <laughs> Very significant question, um, needs a lot of thought. The paper is really very good on making the distinction between pharmaceuticals and chemicals on the one hand and, and other kinds of, sort of manufacturing, engineering technology on the other hand. That's good, but I would actually ask, what about digital technologies? Where about, where's the digital environment in this context? Because if anything, that's the future industry to be thinking about. Uh, and even the United States wrestles with what's the appropriate balance there, I think probably we've gone too far on, on, on the side of protecting uh, digital content creators. Uh, but there's, a, there's an active debate, and that's, uh, that's not gonna go away. And I think in developing contexts, it's really an important question. Final observation, then I'll stop. One for broader discussion, though, is that the <coughs> um, paper leaves me wondering just, just how important are, in, 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 the, in, the, in the context of poor developing countries, how important are these issues of setting legal standards uh, in IP and in, in antitrust when there isn't a lot of innovation going on in the first place? Um, well, so why is there not much innovation in inward technology transfer? And I think the answer is likely coming from issues of the economic size, growth problems, uh, economic climate, and, and all of those kinds of things that we've talked about ad infinitum. Um, so, uh, how to address those contexts? I would, I would suggest calibrating the discussion about IP and competition to fit them into this general question of what are the development processes that really, really are uh, fundamental. Um, and then, is it possible that other policy constraints on competition in developing countries might actually matter more in terms of supporting monopoly practices? Just one story for you and then uh, I'll conclude. In my early days as an international economist studying these kinds of questions, I used to traipse around a lot of uh, cities in, uh, in developing countries, uh, trying to talk to businesses and gut policy makers about exactly these kinds of questions. And one thing I found out is that in much of the developing world, uh, there are constraints on entry into important sectors, including distribution, that are themselves linked to intellectual property. So for example, in many countries, uh, if you are a domestic distributor wishing to sell some product that's protected by a patent or a trademark in your country, typically, or often, there will be a, a domestic sole distributorship law to try to protect your market in addition to protecting the international trademark owner's market. And this turns out to be sort of doubly anti-competitive. Uh, and so I would think that maybe we ought to expand our thinking about, uh, about competition towards a broader <coughs> question of what are the interactions between IP protection and, uh, and market closure. So anyway, I, I, I'm gonna conclude by applauding uh, Thomas for a comprehensive review. Uh, I think the paper is well worth reading and you're gonna learn quite a bit. Um, but I would hope that we can go forward by thinking about placing IP and antitrust into a broader context of development processes. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much. Let's uh, now hear from Shamnad Bashir. Firstly, thank you, uh, Katz, uh, Mr. Pradeep Mehta, Uday, Ujwal, all of you for such a warm welcome and uh, putting together this fantastic um, session on a theme that's close to many of our hearts. Um, and of course, uh, wonderful pleasure to be back here and have a uh, comment on Thomas's paper. We uh, were batchmates uh, and we studied competition law together. Um, 
we were we were all at sea i think uh, at that stage coming into it for the first time and uh, you know as typical lawyers you, the moment you see a graph you tend to run away and competition law was full of economics and graphs uh, at least at the initial stages uh, it's wonderful to 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 hear from him and to see his uh, fantastic paper i'm definitely putting it on my reading list uh, for the students because it uh, encapsulates uh, the key issues um, quite well and quite extensively um, you know, I, I don't know what it is about conferences, but uh, the last conference I was at also, you know, Keith is a very tough act to follow, and they always put me after Keith. Um, so most of what I wanted to say, he's already said it, uh, but I'll try and expand on it um, a, a little more. So uh, Thomas really uh, situates the conflict uh, uh, and the interface quite well in a developing country context, um, and, and I think uh, I'm completely with him on the fact that uh, you know, tilt the balance more in favor of, uh, in many ways, walking into the IP domain um, and doing a little more for the balance between the private monopoly interest of the innovator uh, and the larger consumer welfare of the public interest. Um, and, and, and I think we can shift the balance quite well towards the public interest and consumer welfare, particularly in developing countries, given that we are, we're, we're a bit unsure about the extent and effect of uh, innovation incentives through the patent system on innovation itself, right? So we don't have, we're not, it's a dangerous topic to wade into. Um, like, uh, uh, I think Keith uh, stressed on one point, which is that the judges have a lot of discretion, and that's the point I want to focus on. You're not able to. Oh, yeah. Hello. 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 Yeah, sorry. So judges have a lot of freedom and flexibility to tailor IP jurisprudence in ways that promote consumer welfare, and I think that might be one of the missing links in the paper, and it raises a fundamental issue. I mean, what are we trying to do when we come to this interface and we say, should IP trump competition or should competition trump IP? Uh, I think we need to be very careful here because if the problem is with the IP regime, uh, one would think that logically you need to repair it within the IP regime first. Uh, and this is a tendency that we in India are all too familiar with. Something is rotten in this system, let's prop up another system without addressing what's happening here. We have problems with the planning commission, let's set up a Niti Aayog. We have a problem with the research at universities, we don't get enough research at universities, well, let's set up specific research centers. And this was a brainchild of the earlier Congress government. They wanted to set up hello, hello, centers hello, for advanced hello, legal learning and hello, research hello, because hello, legal research wasn't happening at universities. Hello, hello, so hello, you, you're not... Hello. You're not keen hello, on... Hello. Uh, hello, 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 hello. Competition. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I was wondering if it was a ventriloquy of some sort. Hello, hello. I can charge your head. Okay. Hello. Lots of good substitutes, all about competition. Um, so I think the fundamental question is, uh, if we are trying to repair problems with the IP regime, let's try and focus on how can we repair it within the IP regime itself. Uh, so is there a component of consumer welfare and public interest that we can effectuate through the IP regime itself? Yes. And India is a great example of that. We've seen that uh, injunctions, particularly in pharmaceuticals, and this is a sector that Thomas uh, very rightly focuses on because it is, as he rightly points in his paper, an outlier. You know, in the debates on innovation incentives uh, and whether they work uh, to induce innovation in sectors, pharmaceuticals are the poster child, and Keith uh, stressed on this as well, uh, because it does take an enormous amount of R&D uh, to actually get drugs onto the market. Um, but even there, I mean, my argument is, and this is something I made in my PhD thesis, is that the patent system is really inefficient, uh, even with respect to protecting that outlier industry, because really what we want is we want to protect the investment. We're not interested in seeing how creative the idea that went behind the drug is. And oftentimes, 
the idea may not be very creative. You may have a slanting reference to it in some prior art material, uh, but it takes tons of money to actually build upon that idea to, to make a drug and take it to the market, in which case you're really looking at investment. So can we move from a patent system to an investment protection model where you openly ask drug companies for the amount that they've invested in creating a drug and taking it to the market? And for a long time, they wouldn't give you these figures because it was, a, it was a best known secret and given only to, I think, Tufts University, which came up with a report year after year on uh, the cost of bringing a drug to the market. And obviously, that kept increasing. And now it's about $2.3 billion or, 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 or some such uh, humongous figure. And that figure is disputed. Uh, but we'll never know the actual truth because uh, we don't have a way of getting transparent uh, 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 data on what it costs to bring a drug to the market. But we leave, that, uh, we leave that to the side. Within the pharmaceutical context, when a pharmaceutical patentee goes up before a judge and says, restrain the generic from coming to the market, and this is something the session chair had stressed on uh, the post-patent uh, expiry period, what kind of uh, competition does it engender with generics uh, coming out? Uh, in the first pharmaceutical patent case in India, which was uh, uh, Roche versus Sipla. Roche is a, a multinational Swiss corporation that had a patent on an anti-cancer drug. Uh, and Sipla released a generic version at one third of the cost. It was a very expensive cancer drug. And Sipla's argument was, well, we're serving the public interest because we're bringing something much, much cheaper. And this is a huge cost for the Indian consumer to bear. And the judge bought into that argument and says, yes, public interest is a factor. Before we grant an injunction, it's not, you don't get an automatic grant or an automatic right to get an injunction just because you have a patent right. Injunction jurisprudence will also turn upon, have you established a prima facie case? Is the balance of convenience in your favor? Without the injunction, would you be subject to irreparable injury? Which is actually my favorite factor. This is a critical factor that many courts have overlooked. And Keith is absolutely right. The role of courts, if they actually start looking at these factors more closely, irreparable injury. It means you are entitled to a patent injunction only if you can demonstrate that the injury that will ensue as a result of not preventing the competitor on the market cannot be compensated through money alone or damages. Look at what's happening today. Patents are being increasingly valued, traded, apportioned, partitioned. I mean, gone are the days when you had one inventor, one innovator, one distributor, one, a single entity doing all of these tasks. Now the market is increasingly fragmented. Somebody will invent, will file the patent, typically a university in some cases. Somebody else will take it and develop it, take it to market, get regulatory approvals. Even after they get the regulatory approval, uh, a Pfizer, uh, in the context of, of the pharmaceutical market, may decide to license out the drug to many others in many other markets. So it's several different players coming together. And as a result of which, you need upfront, you need a value for that particular knowledge asset. And that is being increasingly valued. And if it's being increasingly valued, then it's very difficult for a patentee now, in some cases, and in future, in almost all cases, to go up and argue that without this injunction, I would be subject to an irreparable injury, which means it cannot be compensated by money. Ultimately, patents are going to be about money. Right? Let everyone use it. We may come to the day when uh, we have an almost pervasive, what we call a liability regime, where the notion of a strong exclusivity for an IP right, which is, you know, once I have an IP right, I can keep you off my turf because it operates like real property, that paradigm is shifting and shifting quite rapidly to a paradigm where we say, well, let others come into my space so long as they pay some reasonable royalty fee. So we can't keep people out just because we have a patent, but we're entitled to some compensation because they're actually treading on a knowledge asset that we came up with. And if that is what the future is gonna look like, then you've, you're, you're not gonna get injunctions in the way that you got earlier. Courts are going to be more circumspect, and courts are going to permit infringers on the market so long as the reasonable royalty is paid. And if that's the case, consumer welfare is then enhanced, then do you really need the competition authorities to step up into this terrain? Would you still be having this debate that we need this, that there's a patent clash between competition and IP? Well, you've repaired the IP regime to some extent. If consumer welfare was your main concern, you have ways of effectuating it, and TRIPS gives you flexibility. I mean, the notion that you're stuck uh, because TRIPS is so static and so strict is, 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 uh, is a misunderstanding. I mean, for those of you who have read TRIPS closely and seen how countries and courts have begun to operationalize uh, patent regimes uh, and, you know, sort of leverage TRIPS flexibilities, TRIPS is, is, is very flexible. 
And India is experiencing that more and more. I mean, when Section 3D, which is a, a, a beautiful pharmaceutical filter to filter out uh, non-meritorious pharmaceutical patents, typically evergreen patents, you know, where the pharmaceutical company takes one patent and then just before it expires, makes a small tweak in the drug molecule, takes another patent. Section 3D of the Indian Patent Act was brought in to prevent precisely that, saying that small tweaks will not get you an additional patent. You need to demonstrate that that tweak resulted in a significant impact of the additional drug you're bringing onto the market. Now, I think that is a very pro-competitive patent provision because it effectively means that you're preventing a monopolist in the market, a drug patent monopolist, to keep extending their monopolies, but through a tweak in the patent regime. You're not, you've not gone to the Competition Act. You're doing it solely through the patent regime. So I think one is to explore ways in which you can repair the regime from within itself. Uh, and the regime was never meant to protect only innovation incentives. If you go back to the founding charter of many of these patent act and patent regimes, the purpose of patent law is to balance out the private innovation incentive against the larger public interest. And this is not just a socialist republic like India saying it. Uh, this public interest is also a factor in the world's most capitalist economy, the United States. Public interest is a factor, uh, in, even in injunction jurisprudence. And courts have clearly said, Supreme Court time and again, and I think Keith pointed that out, that you will not get an injunction if the public interest is disserviced. And it's not just in the high-tech sector uh, with eBay and the others. It also happens in pharmaceuticals. And it has happened in a couple of cases. In fact, US jurisprudence on public interest goes back to the early 1940s. You, you had a 1940s case uh, where the court ruled that injunction will not be granted because uh, this patent that was meant, uh, that covered a new technology for cleaning sewage was so valuable to the municipality that they had to use it. And the patentee couldn't prevent the local municipality from using this particular patented technology because the larger public interest would be disserviced. Uh, so that's the first point. The second is, let's also look at areas where the, the competition authority may be better placed from an institutional competence perspective to decide the issue. And I see compulsory licensing as a big issue here. India did one of the biggest compulsory licensing cases in the post trips era, again over an anti-cancer drug, uh, priced excessively, uh, a German multinational patent, a buyer, which had uh, was selling it at almost three lakhs a month, uh, which is quite a significant sum from an Indian perspective. Uh, and the generic manufacturer came up and said, well, under the Patents Act, I'm entitled to a compulsory license if I can demonstrate that the patentee is not servicing the reasonable requirements of the public through the patent. And they were able to show that because the price was so high, only 2% of the patient population was actually getting access to the drug. And that was never contested by the patentee. In fact, the patentee's sole argument was that, well, we spent a lot of money to get this drug, so you can't just come in and issue a compulsory license. To which the patent controller said, well, show us what the cost is. And they said, well, we can't do that. It's a trade secret. <laughs> and said, well, too bad. <laughs> then I'm going to issue the license, and I'm going to set a royalty rate that was fairly Arbitrary, but you had nothing else to go by. I mean, not, not really. I mean, it was a UNDP rate. The UNDP had come up with a report a long time ago saying 4 to 6 percent is a decent royalty rate for pharmaceutical inventions. But that's the other battle. I think the battle really is going to be what's the rate going to be? And I think given the economics of the situation, you know, are you, are you serving the reasonable requirements of the public? Are the public getting access to the good? What is the reasonable royalty rate? I think these are issues for which the competition authority, at least notionally, may be better placed to decide than a technocratic body like the patent office whose appointments and whose personnel are mainly trained in the art of figuring out if something is inventive or not. Right? So these are scientists primarily or people with science backgrounds coming in and technology backgrounds to evaluate as to whether or not something is cognitively superior from a scientific technological perspective to merit a patent. If you ask them to evaluate ex post effect of a patent, has it serviced the market well what should a reasonable royalty be? I think there's, there are going to be serious institutional competence issues. So at a policy level, we need to ask whether some of that stuff could be shifted out to a competition authority, but let the turf be clear. And let us not try to solve the problems that are arising in one through just taking it to the other, uh, unless we find that institutionally they're much better placed and more competent to actually take it on. Um, um, is, that, is that all? Yeah. So, uh, Thomas, once again, uh, thank you very much uh, for a wonderful, wonderful paper.
Uh, and like I said, I think it's going to be of tremendous value for many of us who, who, who sort of take a couple of courses in this and uh, teach classes. So it's great reading material uh, to, to start up the students. So thank you very much for, uh, for those thoughts and thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, uh, Shamnath. Um, let's, uh, let's change focus um, a little bit now. And this uh, next presentation uh, is going to look instead at the interest of promoting competition versus the need to give incentives to, uh, to, to innovate. And uh, there's a subtitle, Undecided Clash of Titans from the EU perspective. And so we'll invite uh, Uraf Semelovic to, uh, to come and speak to us. Okay, so good, it's working. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, do you hear me? No? Good. And now, is it better? Okay, so perfect, thank you very much. So ladies and gentlemen, I thought for myself that I'm gesticulating a lot, but after seeing Shamnad, he's absolutely unbeatable competition, so. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I am already afraid that I'm going to be boring after him, but I'll do my best. So first, uh, one very personal remark. It seemed to me uh, when I arrived that you are a big family and that you almost all know each other. And I felt like a distant relative invited <laughs> once every five years. But uh, uh, invite me in next, for the next banal competition and then I'll be a family too. Uh, first, I would like to thank to, uh, to Thomas for uh, using the word balance in his presentation, because it's going to be the key word of, of mine too. And I'm also going to thank him for uh, giving me the idea to excuse myself for being partially incoherent because I had three glasses of wine last night. So <laughs> uh, my reason is better than yours. Yeah. Okay, so... Uh, I'll start with mentioning, like Alan did, that International Crop Science Conference and Exhibition. I noted that I wanted to mention it, and then you, you picked my idea. <laughs> Another competition. So I spoke with a lady when I came to this hotel two days ago, and she basically told me many people thought that pharmaceutical sector is the battlefield between competition law and IP law, but now the sector of agriculture is becoming even bigger battlefield. So my topic is going to be about, let's say, I, I put it metaphorically, two titans in the EU law. One titan is interest to promote competition, and the another is uh, titan is incentives to innovate. Uh, first titan is bigger and older, but second one is getting stronger. I will explain this during my presentation. This is a, just a quick plan of presentation. Then second point is the clash of titans. And I will cover the, the issue of compulsory licensing. And then I've put some issues for, for discussion, some key questions. First of all, the first titan. Uh, why I said that this titan is older in the EU law? Because and maybe this is the right place for this metaphor. Competition, free competition, is the holy cow of the EU law. Like, uh, uh, almost everything is based on four liberties of circulation and free competition. So as soon as the Rome treaties were signed in, in 57, the, the notion of free, undistorted competition was the fundamental notion of the EU, EU law, then uh, European Communities law. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the, the EU's intellectual property law is quite new as a field. Uh, its late development started in 80s, and basically it was the harmonization, but very slow and progressive harmonization of national legislations. Uh, and the level of harmonization was, let's say, very modest. Like, 
the basic common ground for everyone. Then in, in, in 1993, the community trademark was created, but there is absolutely no unitary patent, patent protection in the European Union. None of it. There is European patent organization, but it has nothing to do with the EU. And the EU is trying to introduce the real European mechanism, the EU mechanism, but it's quite far away, and it's going to be like the Schengen Agreement. Some countries will join it, some non-EU countries will join it, while some EU countries would not like to participate in it. We will see. It's still undergoing. But I wanted to really to attract your attention to one very clear uh, juxtaposition of two values. Because basically, we all speak about values here. That's we, why we are so passionate about the topic. Values are behind it, not just the, 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 the you know, simple legal norms. And those two values are, can be found in one very concrete legal document. It's Directive 2004-48, extremely long. And in, uh, in the first recital, the directive mentions the need to eliminate distortion of competition. And in the very same recital of the very same act, you can find the need to create an environment conductive to innovation and investment. So my key point here, first key point would be, my titans in my metaphor, the titans I'm speaking about, are not always fighting. Very often they are collaborating. Uh, yesterday, uh, when we had that idea, that proposition that competition law should be more taken as a more important, supersedes the IP law, and then the gentleman in the first row said, asked a very clever question, should we abolish property as such? So thank you for that question. I think that the crucial idea is let's make uh, Shamnad, what you said, let's make those titans cooperate whenever it's possible. And then when there is a clash of them, then let's try to, to find a balance. Uh, this is my final slide, or almost final slide. I will have the last one when the lady shows me the red sign. Uh, so, um, the key issue and the real situation when those uh, titans clash is the abuse of monopolistic position in terms of EU and antitrust uh, legislation. So what could be considered as illegal beha behavior by competition law in the same time is perfectly legal and legitimate according to another set of rules. And there is an Italian professor, Pardolesi, and he had a really very good point. He actually said that this is a schizophrenic stance where the rules are giving with the right hand while taking back with the left. So this is the situation we now have in the EU legislation. And uh, uh, Shamnad, once again, you had a great point about that. The, the legal system my country now is taking from the EU in its effort to quite rapidly join the, the, the union, is the following. You have one set of rules, and then you have the another set of rules. And they do not communicate with each other necessarily. They conflict very often. So what we heard here is basically very many legal standards. Uh, so that's why, Thomas, the balance and the balancing is the key word. The only universally applicable solution, this is my second point, is to perform the balancing. One side, negative effects for the entity which requested the license of the refusal of IPR holder, and on the other, the prejudice that that very same holder might encounter if compulsory licensing is imposed. But the question I would like to ask to all of you, I don't have a final answer, how to perform that very balancing. How? And then when you have legal standards that can be different countries, then you have 
of course, uh, 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 supreme jurisdiction which takes decisions. But once again, this interpretation is casuistic. Ca par ca. I don't know if m Madame Durand is here. But anyway, it's, you are, yeah. But anyway, it's, it's casuistic and you cannot really understand to which extent the EU supreme legislation defends one or another position. And there was one famous case that it's still commented and still haven't been understood fully. It's case Microsoft versus Commission. And in that uh, the decision, the court provided some element of common, what I called common European response in my article, regarding that balance. And once again, we can hear the legal standards. And that balancing performed by the court was basically that uh, IPR holder should sufficiently establish established that the disclosure of the information would have a significant negative impact. So, let's repeat it. Sufficiently, significant. I mean, what is sufficiently and significant for me definitely could be absolutely insignificant and insufficient for Keith or Alan. So once again, you, would you throw the hot potato into the hands of the one who is entitled to interpret and implement the court's decision. So the entire relation of those two titans, when they clash and collide, on the international scene and on the scene of the EU, looks me like a, a hot potato game between the institution and various stakeholders. So the supreme jurisdiction takes a decision by making the potato even hotter and it, and it throws it into the hands of another institution. <laughs> this is actually the, 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 the situation we have. So uh, my second question to all of you, and I think it's going to be definitely less than 10 minutes because I'm getting closer to the end, is when it shall be considered that the negative impact is established and which degree of this impact should be considered as significant. For the people from that international crop science conference, it could be one thing. For the pharmaceutical sector, it could be another. For the EU legislation, it could be one thing. In one country, one thing. In the other, another. Especially in the light of the fact that, as I already told you, there is no harmonized nor unified patent pr protection in the European Union. There is the one in the European continent, but these standards are not always applicable and they do not always give the answer to the question I tried to, to ask and underline here. So I would like to, to thank you for your attention. Well, thanks very much for, for us. Um, we'll now move to two commentaries on that and the first from Daryl Lim. This is going to help you though. We have five of them now. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Alan, and uh, thank you, Cuts, for organizing this uh, event. I think it, it struck me as quite remarkable that Cuts invited uh, an academic from the US and uh, an Indian commentator to talk about a European perspective on competition law, but never would you do this in, in family law or labor law, uh, indeed most other areas of the law, and I think it's a great privilege to be uh, to gathered together in a room discussing the world's problems uh, from all these different perspectives, and, and uh, not just from an international perspective, but also from a perspective of law and economics, which brings together again two fields which normally would not come together. Um, and I think the agenda today, both in the morning and afternoon, really strikes at the heart of the issues that we need to consider at the intersection between IP and competition law. I've been looking at this area for about 17 years now, since I was about six. And, uh, and my sense is, 
we are not that much closer to finding the solution. I think Ellen and um, Keith both alluded to the fact that we'll be talking about this long after this event is over. And it made me pause to consider why is that. And I think uh, a lot of it has to deal with really a, a divergence in the priorities of different stakeholders, but also a failure to come together as often as we should in settings like these to really understand what the points of view of other stakeholders are. And so I think this event should be congratulated for that reason alone. Now moving on to Euros's presentation, I think his uh, imagery of a clash of titans really vividly illustrates this popular dichotomy between IP and competition. And he notes how in the EU, at least, the burden of proof is placed on the IP owner to show that the uh, compulsory licensing uh, sufficiently to show that the compulsory licensing doesn't significantly harm the IP owner's incentives to innovate. And as he quite aptly puts out, it's a standard and standards are vague by nature. It means that it's difficult in the abstract to predict where the next step will be. So against that backdrop, let me make three general points. First, about rules. The second, about institutions. And the third, about broader issues, implications, and challenges. And if you look at the outline, I've been quite obedient about following the points given by the organizers. And let me say that, like some Facebook status posts, it's complicated, but I'm opt optimistic that in time, we'll find our way through this if we can understand what we can do and what we cannot do. So first, with respect to rules, I think if you look at the story of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, you see many similar parallels. Whenever you have a disruptive technology, the question is, should you regulate it? And then, if so, how much? We know that without any regulation, you have situations like the Silk Road, and you can buy drugs, you can buy guns, money laundering, and, and that causes problems for adoption of new technology. On the other hand, the, the cypherpunks will say too much regulation stifles innovation. And this is a common narrative that we hear also with IP and competition law. But herein lies the instructive lesson from cryptocurrency, that regulation actually legitimizes the innovation. And therefore, we cannot live in a wild, wild west without regulation. We have to have some kind of regulation. If you look at the value of Bitcoin today, it's $7,000 the last I checked up the last two weeks from 5,000. So if you are thinking of buying some after this, I think it's a bullish market. <laughs> now, what about rules trying to reach the right balance? I think when you talk about rules trying to reach the right balance, you uh, assume th at least three things. One, that the balance is out of alignment. Two, that the balance is static and observable. And three, there are, there are only two factors and therefore you can somehow balance them. Let me say first of all that IP law is, contains endogenous mechanisms to regulate competition. This is a point that Eduardo made yesterday in his talk. It's a point also uh, I think that Keith, Shamnath and others have made that within IP law, whether you're talking about the standard in which you need to meet in order to get a patent, the defenses such as patent misuse or uh, and, and remedies such as injunctions or damages are all calibrated to take into account competition policies. And competition law similarly is pro-innovation. We are all very familiar with the static dynamic divide. And if you look at agency guidelines put up by the FTC, Justice Department, and EU and other places, you recognize, and courts too recognize in cases such as Trinco, that you need to differ to the owner of the infrastructure in order to incentivize the investment in creation of future technologies, future infrastructures. 
quick point about sectoral rules. Should we have sectoral rules? Well, as Nitin mentioned, uh, quoting Fritz Malcher, if you ha never had a rule, it's probably better to have several, but since we already have one rule and you have a whole ecosystem built around those rules, it's better just to keep things as they are. Now, in the US, in a case called Activist, which I'd commend to your reading, the, court, the Supreme Court has sidestepped or addressed the dichotomy in a different way. Rather than seeing one has to trump the other, it recognizes that both competition policy and intellectual property policy, in this case, patent policy, define the scope of the patent approach. So the scope of the patent, rather than having a per se legality or per se illegality. Now what that means that is that life becomes more complicated, but it means that you are more likely to reach uh, accurate, reasoned and principled conclusion. Now, on the static and observable point, uh, this is where people often fall into the rational act of fallacy. Economic models are somehow stuck in the 70s or 80s. We know uh, that Richard Thaler won the Nobel Prize this year. One thing that Richard Thaler is known for, economists, and there are like two people in this room that know Richard Thaler apparently, uh, is behavioral economics. And I think what behavioral economics does is it encourages us to dig deeper for what I, I quote uh, Euros' article, sufficiently precise and universally applicable rules. The only thing that's really common to us in IP and competition law is the fact that we're all human. And being human, we tend to have heuristics, we tend to have biases. And one example that uh, Eduardo gave is innovation is the driver of the economy. And the application to that is people are generally risk adverse. Now, if you're risk adverse, it means that you tend to be, especially you see this in the US, unwilling to intervene. Now, why is it then that in the EU and in China and other places, people are more willing to intervene? Because it is more of an administrative system and therefore the risk, there is that incentive to show that you are doing something. There, and in the minds of a person that decides to be a regulator, the s small but significant risk of 9-11 happening is a sufficient reason to crack down on Silk Road-like uh, effects even if it means squelching innovations like Bitcoin. And so that is one explanation for why you have more intervention in uh, regulatory, heavy, administratively heavy industries, uh, countries like Europe and China, and less in uh, the US. Now, as to two factors, Euros talks about international innovation-based ecosystem. I think this is where you need to recognize that there are limits to put in place by both culture and local priorities. There's a limit to what local governments can do. Thomas talks about institutional capacity limits. Uh, there are other limits which m many of us are more familiar with, like corruption, rule of law. Do you have the physical infrastructure su to support innovation? Uh, how do you treat the human resource issue? And this comes, gender stereotypes come into play here. What about the rural-urban divide? Are you comfortable being an agrarian society as Australia, New Zealand, uh, South America has tended towards? Or do you want to be a technologically driven industry like the Nordic countries, US, Korea, and Japan? And of course, we are all fo more familiar these days with the idea of populism. And that leads to what Euros calls inward-looking set of national institutions. And so, all these play into uh, the IP competition balance as well. Now, nationally, each country also has its own priorities. The EU has the single market and the European Court of Human Rights. China has its obsession with the one-party rule of the one-party state and stability. The US, its obsession with laissez-faire, suspicion with government encroachment on private liberties. And so all these also will bleed into and inform the application of IP and competition law. And finally, be careful what you, use, you wish for because if you move towards a technologically driven industry, you're going to have massive disruptions in your labor market, which means a lot of people are going to be out of jobs. And is the national government ready for that sort of transition?
Now, finally, let's talk about broader issues. Uh, Euros talked about, used the analogy of the holy cow. In the US, we think about holy cows quite differently, I imagine, <laughs> than here in India. But carrying on an analogy, you can't keep milking the cow without feeding it. So how do you feed it? Well, you've got basically three options. You could feed the cow with organic food. So the, that means keeping the way that it was supposed to be or the way that it is IP plus competition. And then competition intervenes in exceptional circumstances. Option two, you could feed it inorganic food. And uh, Nitin, Nitin talked about it yesterday. You get rid of the IP system, you rely on government grants. The third is forget about innovation. Be happy where you are, just stay as a third world economy and then uh, you don't have to do that balance. And I think each country has to make its own choice. Now, where does that, all that bring us? It brings us back to the initial point I made, which is you need more neutral forums for discussions of these ideas. Two weeks ago, I organized, I'm a big believer in that, I organized a round table where you, I brought economists, people from industry, people who wanted strong IP rights, people who wanted strong weak IP rights, people who wanted strong competition, Law, not necessarily different people, not necessarily same people, could be different people. Um, and brought them together to say, all right, so explain to each other why these priorities are important to you. And for many of them, it was the first time that they moved beyond the rhetoric, beyond the vilification of the other side to understand that there are certain le legitimate considerations and motivations driving uh, where the other party is coming from, but also solutions which they did not see before, such as endogenous policy levers within intellectual property law. And I'm glad that this same spirit continues at a conference like this, where you not only think about pharma in isolation, but pharma and how that relates to agriculture. You're going to be talking about standard essential patents, you're going to be talking about digital payment systems. Um, and it really, we need to all, in this multifaceted problem, look at it in a multifaceted way because none of us has the key to it. But together, I think we can succeed. So uh, ultimately, the question is, do you improve the lives of your people with the policy decisions that you make? All this is just talk. And I think it was very good that you reminded us that we should be concerned in Pradeep's words about outcomes and not just outputs. Thank you very much. So, uh, thanks, Daryl, and, and now Geeta Guri, who's a former member of the Competition Commission. So we'll have an Australian chair inviting a f Indian former regulator to comment on the European paper. You know, I dislike spaces. Oh, okay. And when it's L-shaped and I'm stuck there, and all four of you keep meeting, so Urof, I'm also an outsider here. But fortunately for me, I, I see a few of my friends, and I must say that I enjoyed reading your paper. I do like the term clash of titans, because uh, we have had clash of titans between the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India and the Competition Commission. And this sort of turf war which has to be settled doesn't come up well. I also know that uh, uh, some of the reasons why I have been invited is because many people would like to know what the Commission is thinking. But uh, uh, I think what is important is to stay with your paper, which I enjoy. And uh, Daryl, I'm so glad to have met you. I've read your paper. I've also quoted you. And I enjoyed the way you put it. Uh, Shamshad is an old friend. I enjoyed what Keith had to say. Now, coming to the paper itself, the two dilemmas, let's not talk about it. That has been going on and that would continue. And you have posed the issues very well. Uh, you have put it in a manner which you say that there could be a clash. And my point is there should not be a clash. And the reason why I think there should not be a clash, 
I think Daryl put it much, much more uh, academically and much more significantly than I would, coming as a former commissioner. But I think the clash. Yeah, <laughs> no, 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 no. I've quoted you. I wouldn't quote you otherwise. <laughs> But you know, the, 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 the fact that really comes up is, it depends on what your focus is and whom you are serving. And if that is not clear, then that's where the clashes that keep coming up. And whatever my chairperson here might say, or Shamnad Bashir says, I think the mischief is done by the lawyers. <laughs> They're the ones who interpret the way they want to and the way it suits them. And that's where the mischief really comes in. I also uh, was very interested in looking and hearing about you on the famous case of the Microsoft versus Commission, but now you have the Intel judgment, which makes it even more interesting because it's a throwback to the Fair Trade Commission saying, where are the economic effects, where are the analysis done, and what is your effective competition, the effective competitor test that is used, which is what I argued for five years saying, that any judgment of the commission must have economic analysis. The lawyers won. So we had very little about economic analysis, and that's where I look at the Intel judgment, because it's the economic analysis, as Dara will agree, will be able to get things more clear. And it's not something that you cannot define what welfare benefits and who are the larger group. It is just how you study it. Now, I do find that in the case of the judiciary, there has been a certain amount of discrepancy in India too. But before I get to India, I think what I would like to point out, and staying with the paper of Uruf, is Uruf or Urus? Urus. Urush. I suppose uh, you'll grant me that much. <laughs> um, there's two conditions. And that's why I said the Intel judgment becomes very important, and you pointed out, is it sufficiently established? And the other one that you have brought out is on the question of how much is the harm? What is the extent of the harm? And in fact, uh, Uruf, I, I thought there was no need to read the rest of the paper. Your abstract was fantastic. It got whatever I wanted. Because there you had said a significant negative impact and whether it has been sufficiently established. Now, these are very, very difficult conditions. You know, to be able to work out the economics of that, and having spent 30 years, or no, about five years in an institution called the Industrial Bank, where we did social cost-benefit analysis, the whole attempt is extremely subjective. And that is why, Shamnath, don't throw it on the Competition Commission to fix royalty. Whatever might be said that Pacific Asia, the Pacific, uh, what, uh, Georgia Pacific methodology that's used is a very, very accountant way of doing it. It's saying that I, these are my costs, I go discount it backwards, but what is the discount rate you use? That's where it becomes very important. And having stated that, I'm glad you brought it up because that's the crucial issue. And therefore, the question that comes up is that if I have to see it in terms of the intel, it makes a difference. Why am I bringing this up? Why am I bothered about what EU says? Because they told me when I joined the commission that the competition law was based upon the European law and the European Commission. I have read a lot of arguments, and I must say I'm still not very clear where the European Commission is going. I am not clear. And I have tried to understand, and the point that you made which was relevant, is that they were trying to make an integrated market, so they lost the focus on competition and went into looking at integration. Now, why am I bothered about it? There is a tendency for us in India to keep on co uh, quoting from the European Commission because we say it's a federal structure, they are more administrative, and therefore better suited to India. But the Indian situation is totally different. And the process that has brought about this differentiation is the fact that we have a different setup. And when we are talking about innovation, something that Shamnath also mentioned, we are talking at different layers. You have the question of the algorithms. 
the ones that Indians are very good because we're very good in mathematics, and then you come into increasing productivity, and then you come into the real lower level where you are going to digitalize, and it's been fantastic. On my flight today, I had a lady who was talking about healthcare and how she's using digitalization to get to primary healthcare centers. So these are innovations all along. Now, what should the competition law do? Should it go against patents? Now, what are the patents that you're talking about? And when we talk about FX, it's not that one becomes protectionist and then gets the Supreme Court to say, look, have you looked at the economic effects? Have you looked at the effective competitor test? But that you have to take a jump and say, these are patents that have a two-way process in a globalization process. If I, as a competition law person, do not intervene in the market and let patents be they are, it throws a signal. It's a signal not only for foreign investment and uncertainty, it is a signal for my youngsters from the Indian Institute of Technology to design more, pat uh, to design more software and get patents. It is also a signal that these patents Indian design could be used within our country. And one thing that I think we shouldn't forget is that in this setup, it is not patents alone, but we're now shifting to the data problem. It's a question of the data issue. Who has the data? How do we handle it? I mean, Europe might have a privacy issue, we would also have, but where we are concerned for the question of economic growth, who wants information? And that's what that lady who told me about the healthcare the primary health center. We are a huge country with diversity of comments and diversity of opinion we need to encourage. Now, let me not go off into my favorite subject, but come back to your very good paper. And here, what I was trying to see is that perhaps, although it's a federal structure and it's a common attempt to create, India has been better at it. We have managed our federal structure well. When we went in for economic liberalization, it was debated over 10 years, and therefore we didn't need so much of a competition policy as an effective competition act. And going from there further into the questions of the rules and regulations that you brought up, I think the point that uh, you made, Rolf, was the fact that in the European Commission they were looking at rules and regulations. Now, when I have been looking at the Competition Act, what is the problem? The core of our act, like your core, is in our preamble, which says the consumer has to be protected. But protecting consumer means protecting competition and not protecting competitors. And several of our cases, that has been the ongoing argument. You cannot protect competitors, let them face the competition, but where do consumers get? Now, if you want to follow an extremely protectionist situation, which is what I think the first speaker hinted, then the regulator is trying to shape the market the way he wants and not the way the market operates. You know, that, that, that's the sort of risk that has to be taken. And I don't know who said it, but what has been the abuse with patents? What kind of abuses do we have with patent laws and that taking place? And I personally feel, do regulators foresee what the markets want? The first argument we've had is with TRI. TRI looks at its internet connections as a natural monopoly. It sees being a natural monopoly long ago should it come into the Competition Commission. The Competition Commission also, when it looks at it, should it look at it as a Facebook, as an international player, or should it look at it at that first level where on that platform a whole lot of my aggregators can get on. These are, con these are, these are considerations that perhaps because of our administrative background, it will take much longer to come out. Um, the other worry that regulators have is, too big to control. But then, you know, uh, you're in a world of uh, the question of dominance. Or you have, uh, 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 you, you have monopolistic competition, but given the cycle of innovations, changes keep taking place. And we've been looking, or at least I've been looking at a lot of the patents, especially the SEP ones, which have gone through a process of standardization, where you also find, for example, in telecommunications, you have about five players. 
So it's that sort of international game which then has to get repeated within our country. And I am so glad that you have uh, brought this aspect of how there could be clashes of titans. But I think in our country, this clash of titans would have to be resolved. So let's go to economics and dynamic economics. You can't take static frameworks. You can't have defining the market with one SNP test. Neither can you define in terms of competitive concerns of looking at marginal cost pricing or pediatric pricing. There has to be a different thinking and out of the box. But that may be sort of one level. So when I'm talking in terms of India and the Indian situation, it's much more complex and it's layered. It's possible people code back China to me and they have been very effective in a protectionist policy, but not in our country. I see the red flag and I think we should flag it as a very good issue. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you very much for that. Now, we have um, uh, a few minutes for some questions, but, but I'd really like to encourage uh, a couple of uh, small uh, principles for the questions. The first would be, it would be good if they were questions, that's always a good thing for question time. Uh, and secondly, because we've got um, six presenters, uh, then it's not going to be all that useful to have questions that are directed to everyone. And if I could encourage, yes, and, um, and however, so, so I'm just asking for some precise uh, questions and as always, we re really would like to get to know you afterwards, so tell us who you are. And then a, a short, sharp question. Uh, then after that, the two presenters are going to have um, uh, a couple of minutes to respond to those. So we'll just collect the questions, and then the presenters at the end of, uh, of, of a few questions will have a chance to, to respond to them. So could we have uh, indications of questions right down here in the middle? Please. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, uh, my question is... Uh, ah, you failed the first test. Who are you? <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm Vikas Kathuria. I teach competition law. So, my question is to Professor Cheng and uh, Professor Maskis. Professor Cheng, I read your paper, 2012 paper. It's nice. I, nobody can disagree with the funda fundamental premise. Well, you need to have system of innovation. So, I have two quick questions. First of all, ICT sector, pharmaceutical sector, they are huge brackets. Even within these two brackets, if you, if, if you look at the sector, there are so many layers, so many slices. And all these different parts of the sector may not be at the same value chain, value ladder. They may not be at the same stage of evolution, first. Second, when exactly do you get to know that the sector has moved from imitation to innovation? When the time comes to nudge it through uh, the policy levers towards innovation. And taking cue from these two points, how do you translate these two economic findings into administrable legal rules? Because we, as lawyers, legal academics, are willing to learn from economics, but we also have to stick to the cornerstone of any legal regime, which is legal satanity. So this is my question to both of you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. So another question, right down the back on the right hand, or left hand side. Mm -hmm. Santanu Mukherjee, I'm a lawyer, specialized in intellectual property, competition, trade laws. My question to Professor Maskus and my dear friend Shamnad. The first question, Professor Maskus, you did mention about the entry barriers that come in in developing countries through distrib distributor contracts and the access is restrained. So do you see a possibility of following, in case of IPR, international exhaustion of rights and allowing parallel imports? And if so, if there is an argument that <coughs> differentiated pricing will stop, do you think that the markets would not stop differentiation? market uh, the price differentiation. And for Professor Shamnath, you have raised quite a number of issues, and I do support them, on pharmaceutical sector. Do you think, apart from the issue of interim 
injunctions and uh, proving irreparable laws. That's generic for all the sectors, I believe. But do you think that there should be sector differentiation looking at pharmaceutical different from other sectors? Thank you. Thank you. And then another question. Do we have another question? Uh, I don't see any more hands. So we might then get uh, uh, very quick responses, if we may, from the two discussants. And then, oh, there was. Please. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, Atiyu Rahman. I'm a former governor of the Central Bank of Bangladesh. Uh, I just want to touch on the points raised by Daryl Lim on the cryptocurrency. You know, uh, as a regulator, it was indeed a big challenge how to regulate these uh, currencies, particularly you know when we as uh, regulators of the financial uh, institutions and the, uh, as, uh, as a central banker, it was uh, almost impossible to really place these new currencies into our money supply system. How much <coughs> money will be created by this process? How to regulate it? You know, we put our heads together, many of the regulators from the developed countries, including New Zealand the, and others, and also developing countries, it was almost impossible to really find out how much really currencies we will push into the, into, into the market and what will be its impact on inflation, on shadow banking, and how do you do that? In fact, I wanted to do an experiment, but my central bankers always discouraged me, and I thought, you know, if, if it could be possible, if, if a central, uh, on, you know, if we could create certain amount of, say, money, say, it's $100 million, you know, just for these currencies, and, and just uh, put it in the vault, in a machine, that, and pass that money to, say, mobile financial service providers, or to an agent bankers, or to other, you know, and then we would exactly know that this is the money which we have put into the market. But my central bank colleagues, I am not a central banker as such, I am an economist, you know, I was a governor only. They thought I was a mad, mad governor, and uh, this is not possible, actually, you know. And uh, uh, this uh, challenge remains. I really, if you have any ideas how to convince the central bankers to, you know, really regulate the money, the cryptocurrencies or the Bitcoin you are talking about, you know, how do we really regulate with the, with the, with the, with the other currencies and give a, a prudent monetary policy in that context? I'm sure that Daryl will have some responses, but I suggest that would be in the parallel session uh, rather than this one. I think that would be a, a much better place for, for that discussion to occur. So if we could get just a very quick response, yeah. uh, so we allow some time for our presenters also. Yes, I realize I'm keeping us all from tea, so I'm going to try as quick as I can, which means the answers probably won't be that helpful. Um, the first question had to do about do with how do you translate economic findings into legal structures, uh, particularly in contexts like the digital environment. These are difficult questions. I don't think economists are all that good at sort of offering up exactly what will work and they're thinking about their results. Uh, my my uh, basic answer is it would be great if we could figure out a way how to experiment across jurisdictions and countries and try to figure out what would work. But failing that, uh, I think what, what you have to do is figure out what are the right set of principles, what laws implement those principles, and then rely essentially on the administration and the courts to figure out uh, the interstitial problems. On, on parallel trade, exhaustion, um, these are ways to discipline these kinds of distribution uh, monopolies. I, I agree with that. It's not an easy question at all. A parallel trade and exhaustion, if you had that on a global scale, and actually that was to generate some price uniformity, that could be a problem for actually uh, having access to products in developing countries. So it's not easy. My own, I've written a lot about this. My own view is that in, in, uh, in areas like pharmaceuticals, uh, price differentiation associated with limits on parallel trade might actually be, be, be um, beneficial. 
Um, thanks, Shantanu. Um, I, I, I think absolutely, yeah. I mean, you, you definitely need sector differentiation, and I think it's a point that Geeta also stressed upon. Uh, and I think that's really going to be the future wars is, uh, you know, are you going to have a comprehensive sector-specific regulatory framework that will address most of the issues that we're seeing today at the intersection? So pharma is a great example, because pharma, you have the patents, personnel, you have the patent office, you have the competition authority, and you have the drug price control authority, and the drug regulatory authority as well. That's approving it to come on the market. So you have several different kind of regulators uh, that are coming into the picture. Uh, and I think it may need a very, very specific regulatory uh, response in the future with a very clear demarcation of turf. So you know, and, and, and Gita, you're absolutely right. I mean, given the Indian context, I would not recommend compulsory licensing to go before the Indian Competition Authority because I was telling someone last night, I was reading some of the decisions on the IP competition interface uh, that were rendered by the Competition Authority in India uh, during the flight, and I really wanted to bang my head. Uh, I mean, they were atrocious, to say the least. One is, you know, our Supreme Court and our courts are still struggling with the issue of the copyright versus design interface. And here is a competition authority that says in car spare parts, there is no copyright. I mean, they've, you know, here's a person with no legal training, effectively. Uh, here's a Supreme Court struggling with the issue. <laughs> and a competition that says no copyright. And you cannot mark up the price of the spare parts by 100% because that's excessive pricing. I mean, on what basis do you come up with it? Which is why sector-specific Shantanu, as you mentioned, is important. Because car spare parts, we don't care how much you mark it up by. To as much as we care about pharmaceuticals. And I think that, so, so these are the concerns that we need to take care of uh, in the future. Just a very, very short point on sector specific again, that you might also want to consider the impact on small inventors. That could be a way to promote competition. So a way for a small inventor to break into the market could be through the patent. And we've seen that across the board. Uh, you know, when, when it's an entrenched industry, a small patent on a small technological innovation could actually help a small person come into the market. And that might require, again, a different response. And judges have been partial. You'll find that even left of center judges that are not so pro-patent suddenly should be our key question. And then what Gita said, it's an international game. So let me very briefly tell you a story that happened in UN fora something like 20 years ago. I know it because my father told me that story. There was a group 77 in which ex-Yugoslavia and India participated. And they, they had to create a common position concerning the issue of environment. And then the Indian representative said to my father, who was presiding the group 77, please tell them, tell the others, developed countries, let us pollute the planet as much as they did while they were developing, and then we will adopt all the pollution standards they demand. So I think that the, uh, on the international scene, IP rights and competition, there is, no, uh, 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 there, there is no answer how to improve lives of everyone. So we, had sh we should find a solution that is internationally acceptable. And it's even hotter potato than those I spoke about. Because what is good for you, maybe it's not for me or for Thomas, uh, and so on. So that's my final point. Thank you. And, and thank you. Uh, we had some uh, great presentations, uh, good discussants, and thank you also uh, to participants for, for some of those finely honed questions. Lots coming out of this. We won't, we won't deal with those right now. They'll be picked up later. I'd like you all to join me in, in thanking the presenters and discussants, and then uh, going to...